Bell of the TA Marishville Community College. It is a meeting in which we have our featured speaker, Sir Dennis Byron, the former president of the Caribbean Court of Justice. We also have our Prime Minister, Dr. the Right Honorable Keith Mitchell, and other special invited guests. Uh, what would happen this morning is that uh, Sir Dennis Byron, he would speak on Grenada's accession to the appellate jurisdiction of the Caribbean Court of Justice. It is a special meeting in which he will present to you and then you will be given the opportunity to ask your questions. At this time, I'd like to hand over to our chairman for this morning, Mr. Robert Branch, and Mr. Robert Branch is a member Good morning. I hope the issue has been resolved. It is now my pleasure to invite Mr. Tyler John to do welcome remarks. <laughs> Dr. The Right Honorable Keith Claudius Mitchell. Sir Dennis Byron, former president of the CCJ, Mr. Robert Branch, senior legal counsel, lecturers, students, the media, everyone, good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to the TA Marshall Community College and to tell you that we are honored to have you here. Um, I hope, we hope that your sitting here is very informative and enlightening and that you will leave here knowing more about the CCJ and all that they have to tell you. Thank you very much. I invite you now to stand as I ask Tariq Rayburn to lead us in prayer. I ask that you get yourselves in a reverent state of mind and position. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father God in heaven, I ask to please bless these proceedings. Please bless the minds and hearts of everyone here. Please allow us to take in all the information that, that will be offered today. Please help us to really understand the importance of this forum and this function, Lord. Lord, I ask to please bless all the people who are here. Please bless all the people who are on their way that they will arrive safely. As we pray the prayer that you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For then is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Actually, I have to ask you to stand again as we sing the national anthem of Grenada. I'm not the best singer, so you'll definitely have to help me. Hail Grenade, land of us, we pledge ourselves to thee. Heads, hearts, and hands in unity to reach our destiny.
you may have your seats. Dr. the Right Honorable Keith Mitchell, Prime Minister of Grenada. Sir Dennis Byron, former president of the Caribbean Court of Justice. Lecturers, students, members of the media who are facilitating this live broadcast, and everyone joining this live broadcast. It is my pleasure to add words of welcome to that of the T.A. Marishal College, expressed by students. On behalf of the CCG Advisory Committee, I welcome you to this engagement with students of the TAM CC. This is a historic moment. It is not often that an issue of national importance is addressed in this matter in TAM CC. The central issue to be discussed this morning is Grenada's accession to the appellate jurisdiction of the Caribbean Court of Justice. We are already members of the CCG in its original jurisdiction. So the central issue is whether Grenada should accede to the appellate jurisdiction of the Caribbean Court of Justice. Our constitution provides the manner and form for this process, section 39, which include agreement in the House of Representatives, which we've already secured. It includes approval in the Senate, which was secured last Friday. The final stage now is approval by two thirds of persons voting in a national referendum, which is scheduled to take place on the 6th of November this year. So two thirds of persons voting in this referendum must approve the bill before we can accede to the appellate jurisdiction of the CCJ. So this way, this is so significant. And to underscore the significance, we have with us this morning the Prime Minister, Head of Government, who by his presence is endorsing this initiative, and it was the government who promoted this issue in the Parliament. And we have also a former President of the CCG who is eminently qualified to address this issue. Now, many of you have been saying that we have older people making these presentations, and you're probably wondering why we have a retired judge coming to make this presentation. But I can tell you that Sir Dennis Byron is very au fait with the technology. And I had to take him here very early this morning, and he had a bit of difficulty getting his internet connection. He wanted to do a special presentation. I hope I'm not stealing his thunder. But I hope it, it works out. But he's very au fait with technology and how best to engage with students and the general population. But before we hear from Justice Byron, it is my pleasure to invite the Prime Minister of Grenada to make a few remarks. Prime Minister. Thank you, Robert. Sir Dennis Barron. Teachers. My press secretary was here with us. Members of the press, sisters and brothers all. First of all, let me say from the outset that I'm extremely impressed with the turnout that you have demonstrated here today. I think it's a clear indication of your interests and clearly those who have made the contribution in ensuring this is as organized as it appears to be. I do want to give my congratulations and thanks to you. I just left a, a meeting of the Ministry of Finance, as you know, as Minister of Finance, and uh, I indicated to them that I was going to be at this important session, so I had to leave them early. But I want to make a point of the, what is happening and how it affects some of the decisions that we do. If we are going to the referendum on November 6th, as 
Robert has already explained to you the cap parliament has already met and passed over two thirds, which is part of the constitutional um, constraint that we have. And of course the Senate and now the referendum of the public. It means that my budget was normally supposed to be presented every year and have flexibility in presentation of the budget between now and November. It has tightened my schedule to the point that we might have to go down late in November. And the reason is if we parole parliament as we have to do as part of the condition, it meant that every bill that we have passed, including the one for the CCJ, would have died. And means that we'd have to go to a new parliament session and then you have to have the three months at least extensive discussion in the public, which we have done already, because it would be a new phase. So it means that um, we have, the re reason I'm stating this is that we have accepted that this is so important an issue that we have sacrificing our agenda and government to some extent to ensure that the people of our country are given the opportunity to decide on this important matter. I do want to also, this is not my meeting, this is the meeting of the former president of the Caribbean Court of Justice who we are fortunate to have here today. Um, so I may leave you before the end of this because it, it is his session. I've decided to be here with him. I'm saying to him, Sir Dennis, we are extremely fortunate and we deeply appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to be here with us in this very crucial time. And to say to all of you here, for those of us who are ahead, very advanced in age of you, your time, this is more about you than it's about us. I firmly believe this. The government will not have decided that in the face of what was considered to be an attempt we made last time not having succeeded, to have placed this back on the agenda so soon. And there are persons who may be concerned of the why are we back here at this time? What is the necessity? Some are stating, what is the urgency? I think I would want to see this. This is as urgent as you could find it. We have independence, yes. But we're independent to a point. Our final appellate court is not in our hands. And you know, sisters and brothers, to me, this is not a political issue. It's unfortunate when issues of national importance are before us, sometimes petty political interests come into play. This is beyond and above partisan political interests. This is not an NNP issue. It is not an NDC issue. This is a national issue. And let no anybody from whatever label we come from tell you it's anything else but that. It is your future. I recall when we were getting independence, 
course in the 1974. There were debate on independence, and independence should not have been a partisan political issue, but it became that. To the point that decisions were made in our constitution, I'm quite clear about that, was based on who was in office at the particular time. And long after that person has left us, we are left with a constitution which is certainly not suited in many respects for our present time. In other words, the CCJ is not about any, this, just a discussion of this time. It's about the future of this country. And that's why I believe it's so necessary for you to be actively involved in what it means and how it affects your future. How what is now our final court, what if effects it's having on your present and your future. These are issues at your level that must be debated. I'm convinced, my dear sisters and brothers, that we are mature enough, we are capable enough, and we are clear about what is best for us. And I'm clear that we have the quality of jurists and personnel within our region that we should, in fact, as a Caribbean people, have our own final court in our hands. As it stands, Grenada signed on to this a long time ago. We are financing the CCJ a long time ago, a part of the Caribbean community's decision. So the question of cost does not arise. We are already paying for it. Let's use it. So this morning, as I said, I would have enough opportunity to speak to you on several forums. But I thought that having the, our TAM CC students and our youthful population get an exclusive opportunity to engage someone in the capacity of Sir Dennis to hear from him, to ask him questions. I think he's quite prepared to listen to you, to answer any question, critical and otherwise. And you should not fail yourself to take the opportunity to do so. As I said when I began, I'm impressed, extremely impressed with the level of turnout today. And we insisted that the stations and the media houses give this full coverage. So you would be, you are being watched nationally and most of our television and media houses this morning. So I wish you all the best. I look forward to a stimulating morning watching the future of our country. And as I sat there, I said, it could be in this audience the next prime minister of this country, or a prime minister of the country in the future. It could be the next CCJ president here, and all other persons or uh, positions. So this might be a historic session. You all should keep that as part of your history, because you never know. One day you might be referring to this in a, some different capacity. 
Good morning, everybody, and I look forward to the rest of this morning's session. Thank you all. We thank you, Prime Minister, for your remarks. And it is now my pleasure to invite Daria McMill to introduce Sir Dennis Byron. It's going to be a shortened version of Sir Dennis's bio. If we read the, the entire bio, it will take a long time. Good morning. Sir Charles Michael Dennis Byron was born in Bastet, St. Kitts on July 4th, 1943. He won the Leeward Island Scholarship in 1960 and went on to read law at Fitzwilliam College, Cambridge University, from which he graduated with an MA and an LLB. In 1965, he was called to the Bar of England and Wales by the Honorable Society of the Inner Temple. His judicial career began in 1982 when he was appointed as High Court Judge of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. In 1999, he was appointed Chief Justice in of the Eastern Caribbean Court. In 1997, he launched the, the Judicial Education Institute as a committee of the Chief Justice Chambers. The committee produced a code of ethics for judges and organized a series of seminars and training programs providing orientation for judges, lawyers, and court registrars. He was elected president of the United Nations Inter International Criminal Tribunal in May 20, 2007 succeeding former President Eric Moos of Norway and was re-elected for a second term as president in May 2009. As president of the tribunal, Mr. Justice Byron was responsible for the overall management of the court and liaison with members, uh, member states as well as the UN Security Council. Sir Dennis Byron has had a particular interest in judicial educational activities. He has been the president of the Commonwealth Judicial Education Institute, JCEI, since the year 2000. In 2000, Mr. Justice, Mr. Justice Byron was knighted by the Queen Elizabeth II, and he was appointed as a member of the Privy Council in 2004. Also in 2004, he was appointed as an honorary bencher of the Honorable Society of the Inner Temple. Sir Dennis holds the first Yoga Sankheti Chair in the Human Rights Law, Dalhousie University, Nova Scotia, Canada. He is married to Lady Norma Byron, and they have six children. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Mr. Prime Minister, teachers, students. You know, whenever I hear a CV like that read, my first reaction is to simply say thank you and sit down while you still have a good impression of me. <laughs> but I know I can't do that because this is a very important session. You know, as I looked at you all, I thought to myself, the, the old saying, uh, once a man, twice a child. Because here am I, in the twilight years, having been put out to pass, just to say, um, I'm now in retirement. So maybe I'm in my second childhood. <laughs> and I remember, as I looked at you all coming here today, the vibrancy and the energy kind of touched my heart. And it made me remember when I was in sixth form. I'm telling you. <laughs> now, the joke is this, right? You know when I was in sixth form? In 1959 and 1960. Before you all were dreamt about. <laughs> I, was, I was asking um, the young brain of Robert Branch to calculate that. And you tell me that was something like 58 years ago? Long time. But let me tell you, in those days, the CCJ did not exist. But as a young chap growing up, full of enthusiasm about the independence and human rights, my right as an individual human being, 
to stand on an equal footing with people anywhere else in the world. It was already an aggravation to me that appeals to my country had to go to England for English letters to deal with. I was looking forward to the day from a young boy when we would have control over our judiciary. And as I look at you all, do you all have that same drive, that same feeling of self-importance that you want to be responsible for your own affairs? <laughs> Somebody said yes. Who said? Don't be afraid. Because I don't want to lecture you all, you know. I would like to have an interactive discussion with you. Because when I was in sixth form, I was a very argumentative fellow. Now, maybe that's why I'm here today. And I'm hoping that some of you all in this audience are already imagining a future where you will become world leaders. Because that is what sixth form prepares you for. So part of what I wanted to do was really to find out from you what were the issues that were of interest to you. I, I would imagine that as six form students, you have basic information about the court. I mean, um, I could give you information if that's what you want. But, but, but I thought it might be that there might be issues about the court that was of interest or concern to you. And so if there's anybody who had any issues, I would much prefer to have a discussion, a question and answer session, where we could deal with issues of interest and provide basic information. No, nobody does that. All right. Now, I would ask questions as to what was, what was of concern to people. And I was told that one of the issues people were worried about was that there was a general fear about bias, about impartiality. People were saying that because the judges were from the council were far away in England, they were less prone to political and other interferences. And I've been trying to understand what that meant, why people actually thought that way. And then I had a kind of a funny experience last week. Um, I met a guy, someone who was pretty close to me, not just anybody, a very intelligent fellow who had a medical problem. And his doctors told him that he had to go to Miami to get an MRI. And so he spent his money and he went to the hospital. Now, I don't know if any of you all have ever had an MRI or if any of you had anybody who had an MRI in your family. But they put you in, a, in something like a coffin and they push you in a machine which covers your whole body. And because it is known that some people get terrified when they're in, in the closed places. They give you a button that you can squeeze if you get scared. They explained all that to him. And they pushed him in the cylinder. And the minute he reached there, he squeezed the button. <laughs> now, he told me he couldn't help himself. He knew that he needed it. He knew it was for his own good, and yet he was scared. There was no logical reason for his fear, but he was. Now, of course, they took him out, and they spoke to him. I was a little bit embarrassed at one of the explanations they gave him, because they told me that about 30% of persons who do this MRI press the, the panic button. And nearly every one of them are men. <laughs> but eventually, he decided to will himself, force himself to go to the experience. 
and he actually had the MRA on his second attempt. And he was able to tell me that the doctors gave him a clean bill of health afterwards. Now, the point is this, right? Sometimes you can't discuss and convince people about fear. If you're afraid of something, you're afraid of it. But you have to confront it. At the CCJ, a um, lot of thought has been gone into confronting the issues which cause this fear. The selection process of judges is the best in the world because there's an independent commission uh, the politicians are not connected to it and the judges are selected based on merit. I'm quite certain this has been explained to you over and over again. Um, the financial arrangements of the court uh, does not depend on any government or any politician. The, we manage our own budget and our own finances completely independently. The judges come from diverse background. I heard somebody making a comment earlier this morning about the judges going to the same schools and so on. But, but that's far from the truth. Uh, first of all, even if we went to the same schools, we're all different ages. I mean, the guy who is the next oldest guy from the criminal court is 14 years younger than me. We didn't go to the same school. And I went to school in England, all from the Caribbean. We have, a, we have judges, one of our judges is from St. Vincent. One of our judges is from Trinidad. We have a judge from Jamaica. Huh? We have a judge from Belize. We have a judge from England. And we have a judge from Holland. Very different backgrounds. And the court does not sit. One judge does not make a decision. When the court sits, it sits in a group of five judges or a group of seven judges. Sorry. You all are not hearing me? Yes. Okay, sorry. So the idea that a decision could be influenced, you know, we think that a lot of care has been taken to remove those kind of risks. Yeah, people still talk about it. Why? Do you all have any, uh, any questions about that that I can help to talk to you about? Yes. There is a concern that among the Caribbean islands, yeah. there can be some biases. For uh -huh. example, Trinidad, Jamaica, they may have some little indifference there. That may get into the court house to uh, influence judgment. Or Yes, as I was saying, there is a concern among the Caribbean islands that biasness can, be, can exist in the judgment given. For example, Trinidad and Jamaica may have some indifference, and that can uh, be displayed in the judgment given uh, between a Trinidadian and maybe a Jamaican or Barbados. Uh, so there is that concern that... Uh, Caribbean people could have. I, could, I, could I address that for you? Yes, please. Now, <laughs> that is a very normal concern. Because the first point is, judges are not gods. Judges are human beings. Judges all over the world are human beings. And one of the, as I mentioned to you, I've been involved in judicial education programs. And we know that every human being has biases. When you become appointed as a judge, you don't stop being a human being. And we pay a lot of attention to that. In our judicial training programs at the CCJ, and those in which we have a chance to, to 
to give. We devote sessions helping people to identify what their biases are. These biases are based on ethnicity, on where they come from, their social background, their religious background. There are lots of different um, things which affect how people face problems. This affects, you read about English judges, it affects them too. In fact, one of the very famous cases from the highest court in England, and, I, and I'm sure you all must have heard about it, the, the Pinochet case. You've heard about it, right? Where the, where the House of Lords gave a decision against Pinochet, and it was then discovered that the wife of one of the judges was part of a pressure group which was criticizing Pinochet. And the court went and sat, and they decided that the judgment was, could appear to be biased, and they ordered a retrial. Now, this is a fact of life. There's a lot of jurisprudence discussing these issues. And I'm quite certain that you all are aware of the fact that the law requires that if there is the appearance of bias, not actual bias, if there's an appearance, and the, we define a lot of circumstances where bias could appear to exist, the duty of the judge is to recuse themselves from the case. And that is the obligation not only of the judge himself, but of the bench as a whole. Now, I do not accept that if there's a case with somebody from Jamaica, a Jamaican judge is going to be biased because of that. I don't, I don't think that is a normal expectation because everywhere in the world, the judges come from the communities where the disputes arise. And it is generally accepted that it is far better for people to understand the community to be judges. Uh, but if there was a situation where there were circumstances which could give rise. Now take for example, one of our judges is from Belize and he is related to the Prime Minister of Belize. So if a case came before the court where the government of Belize was involved or interested in the case, he would never sit on a case like that. So steps are being taken to ensure that cases of this nature are dealt with in the interest of justice. And in fact, we have had a situation where the CCG has already given a number of decisions where it has criticized and set aside judgments in the courts below where judges should have recused themselves because of the appearance of bias. So that is something that we are very conscious about and which we hope that our actions would convince the public because our court is not uh, an idea anymore. It, we have been existing now for 14 years and some of these problems have been confronted. We have had a case, for example, where you mentioned Trinidad, you mentioned Jamaica, and you mentioned Barbados. Now we have had a case where a young girl from Jamaica sued the Barbados government and she got justice. The fact that she didn't have any power group, uh, anything, anybody to back her, and she fought the government of Barbados, didn't stop her from getting a fair trial. Uh, and, and we have had several cases where we have made orders against several governments. We've made orders against the government of Guyana. We've made orders against the government of Suriname. We've made orders against the government of Barbados against the government of Belize. In fact, I had a clip recently because somebody had asked me this question earlier uh, because the Prime Minister of Belize and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Belize were very upset about a decision the court had made against the government. And they had made public statements of great criticism. But 
when they were confronted, you know what they said? They said, well, we know the judges are human beings and they're not immune from criticism. They made a decision which we didn't like and we think we had the right to criticize. But we know that they didn't take any bribe. We know that they did what they thought was the right thing and we have to accept the judgment. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes. Um, one question, and, uh, one question and, I, and just a yes or no, and then I would ask you to make a strong case for Grenada, uh, Grenada's full participation. Grenada? Uh, yes, let me restate it. I would ask you a question first. Uh, in the case of Barbados and Jamaica, was justice completed? Not just recognizing the fact that one was in the wrong, but was the compensation made? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Good. Thanks. L let me tell you something. There's uh -huh. been a lot of um, talk about that, right? But every judgment we have given against the government mm -hmm. has been honored. Okay, good. Shanique Mary has been paid in full. Okay, nice. Okay. So the case I would like you to make, uh, because we have young people here, and uh, soon, uh, maybe some of them are qualified to support Grenada's uh, acceptance, uh, mm -hmm. full participation. And mm -hmm. I will tell you that I support that move. Mm -hmm. I think it's necessary for us. Thank you. Um, so I want you to make a strong case for the audience here mm -hmm. that they can see as a good reason to embrace Grenada, embracing the CCJ in full and uh, support those who can vote and probably spread the news around, because we need that. As yeah. you said, it's time that we take care of our affairs in the Caribbean. I and it's, so. it's time that we trust ourselves and trust our judges and so forth. So I want a strong case to be made so that mm. Grenada can fully embrace this reality. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, somebody in the back. Um, you're in sixth form still? <laughs> I am a sixth form student. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, good morning, good morning to my morning. colleagues morning. and PM, my distinguished colleague. Thank you. We need the CCG. I'm going to listen carefully. And I applaud the Prime Minister for being so bold at this point in time to put the CCG forward. But I have a problem. Tell me. The problem is that the CCG is not the end of a process. Not the end? No. It's the beginning of a process. Oh, dear. Because... Oh, you didn't see that? No, tell me. Good. <laughs> because why? The CCJ is a change of the head. All the laws we have were inherited laws that we had no contribution in. So all the laws we inherited from colonialism, they are there. The CCJ is governing over that. They have not changed. In fact, some of the laws are so ridiculous. You ever heard this word before? Ridiculous. That, for example, you cannot build a house a building bigger than the, bigger than the high school coconut tree in the area. Um, no, hold on, I ain't finished yet. Okay, sorry. <laughs> that is one. So that's the beginning of our process. Yeah. So we have to, first of all, CCJ as an as a, as a, as a element to push forward, to evolve. That is one. One, the laws have to be changed next time. May I answer that one first? So you no, can no, give, I, give I, I'll, I'll, I'll finish, I'll finish. I'll give you time to answer. Okay. And next thing is that we need to have a system in place for the mafia, the, the, the mafia type of lawyers we have in the Caribbean. So the CCJ has to put the regulation in place to ensure that when a lawyer takes my money, he takes your money, and he tells me to plead guilty, he has committed an offense, his license can be revoked, and he can be charged, as he's done in New York. All right. No, I ain't finished yet. Hold on. You have your chance. You hold on. Because you see me back out in me, and I have to move. <laughs> so that, that, is, that is the one, too. Yeah. Not only that, my constitution that is given to me in 1974 is in jail. He lock is up. Where? Is where? It's in jail, he lock up. I cannot get a... I have never seen a constitution. What I'm saying is that let the constitution be user-friendly. In Venezuela, for example, you will see the president pull out the constitution in the pocket and say, look at it here. Everybody in Venezuela has a right to a constitution. My own lock up in a library, in some big law office, or something like that. So, we do. Anybody here know the constitution? Has seen the commission? No. So, it is. It, 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 but you. But, no, it, hold on, hold on. It is available. Have we seen? Do we understand our constitution? 
right. Then no, it doesn't no. make sense to us. No, no, I, actually, I, this no, is my I, I'm going no, now. No, 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 no. <laughs> Look, this is my meeting. You're saying enough. Um, let, let, me, let, me, let me answer you in different ways. Now, I had this question one time in Antigua. And I made a, what I thought was a very obvious statement. That if under the Privy Council, you are not satisfied with the quality of justice in the community, why do you say you want the Privy Council to continue and you don't want to change? People used to say, in my understanding, that is a sign of insanity to do the same thing and expect something different. Thank you. So if you are not satisfied with how things are now, with the Privy Council as a final code of justice, I don't think that's a good reason to say you don't want the CCJ. Now, I'm saying, secondly, the second point you made about the antiquated colonial laws. Now, one of the reasons for having the CCJ is that we are dealing with that already. Now, and yes, the technicians do their business. Let's talk. Yeah, but listen, but listen carefully. I am saying we need the CCG. I understand that, but I want. But you made a point about being a part of a process. Thank you. And I'm telling you, the process has, has started. But, but that's the first time I heard that. The, 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 one of the reasons why. Um, the old-fashioned colonial laws are still holding back our communities is that they put in the Constitution, and I say they put in the Constitution something called the Savings Clause, <laughs> which you, you know what that means, right? <laughs> students don't know what the Savings Clause is? <laughs> eh? No students don't know the Savings Clause? No. Oh, come on, man. You all should know that. I, I, no, I hear you all have people doing A-level law here in, in, in this room. You, you, ah, you read about it. Good, thank you. What the Savings Clause says is this, right? That if a law was passed before independence, <laughs> our Caribbean judges cannot say it was unconstitutional. They're saved. Of course. Now, 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 now. And a lot under the colonial leadership of the Real Council, no judge could, could do that. But we gave a very um, um, important decision um, a few months ago where we explained that the savings clause could no longer prevent us from declaring colonial laws to be unconstitutional and moving forward for the benefit of our people. So we have already started that process. Thank you. Thank you for the information. Because and then, some of that. Uh, one of the things that we have been saying about this issue, Jay, is that we want to play a role, and we have been playing a role mm -hmm. that the Privy Council is not doing for judges in the Caribbean, or that they're doing it for judges in England. We have been very interested in spearheading reform in the judicial process. And we have done a lot of stuff already. In fact, right here in Grenada, and Mr. Branch could tell you, of the, about three years ago, there was a, a, a concern that there was a severe backlog in civil cases. Yes, so you, know, you know about the project. And they came to us, and we designed a, a system of managing it, and the backlog was reduced to zero in 18 months. So we've already demonstrated in Grenada that practical problems which affect the society, we can remedy them immediately, and we're available for immediate action to support um, improvements in the way justice is done. So I say this, as dealing with the bread and butter issues, which affect social life on a day-to-day -day basis. And in fact, many of our decisions have, um, have demonstrated this approach. 
I, I don't know if, 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 if the, the Ventos case um, got traction in Grenada. Who said yes? Okay. Well, I don't want to, I see, I did not want to give a lecture. I wanted to engage in an interactive discussion. So you tell us about the Ventos case. You remember it? Um, yes, the case of Professor Ventos. Uh, That's right. Come to the microphone. What? You're docking you now? You ain't finished with you No, no, I have it. No. <laughs> I have it with you. But I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Well, let's move forward. You see? All right. The Vendor's case, was, which was interesting about it for me, was that this is a situation which involved the elections. Somebody was saying they had a right to vote and they would not put them on the voting list. And the week before the election, the matter reached the CJ. And they filed a case at 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Now, you know in your normal court registries, the office shut down. You can't file a document until Monday morning, 9 o'clock. But at the CJ, because we have got um, modern technology aimed at improving access to justice. You could file a case using our e-filing portal 24-7, any hour of the day of the night, any day of the week. And they were able to file their case at 5 o'clock on Friday afternoon. And because the electoral register lists were going to be closed on the Monday. We heard the case on Sunday and gave a judgment in time for that person to be put on the electoral list. So you're dealing with a court that is responsive to the needs of the society and is willing to take action which would have a direct impact on improving the quality of life in your society. I have two questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, in everything, we, we know there are pros and cons, advantages yes. and disadvantages. What would you consider to be one of the disadvantages or concerns of us moving from Privy Council to the CCG? The second question, it hinges on Mr. Williams' question just now. What do you have in place to protect us normal citizens from, for example, the exorbitant fees our local lawyers might charge us when we have to um, bring a case forward to the CCG. All right. I'm sorry I asked you the first question because I know that reasonable people are supposed to see pros and cons. I think I'm reasonable, but I don't see any disadvantages in coming to the CCG at this point in time. In fact, as I mentioned to you, I dreamt about a court like this long before it existed. So when I was actually selected to serve on this court, it was like the culmination of a lifelong dream since I was going to school. I don't see any disadvantages. Now, we have been very, we think that one of the benefits of the CCJ is improving the issue of ordinary folk having better access to justice. So the first thing is that the filing fees to file a matter before the court is small. It's much smaller than going to Privy Council. Well, um, from beginning to end, it's about $500. You understand? From beginning to end. But. US dollars, from beginning to end. Um, now, the, but we have provisions in our rules that persons who cannot afford to pay the fees are granted exemption from the fees. And we have already made 46 orders allowing people to file cases without having to pay fees. Then we have got 
very much involved in trying to encourage um, support for people who cannot, who cannot afford to pay lawyers. And one of the cases that we have dealt with, I'm sorry. Can everyone stand, please? Thank you. You can have a seat. Yes. Uh, without going into much detail, uh, we have had cases where we have been able to encourage lawyers to provide pro bono assistance to persons who could not afford to pay their, their fees. And many of the lawyers who have done that have expressed pride that they were able to appear before the highest court and that they were able to give charitable service to needy people. So we think we've made a contribution in that area. But more importantly, our technology has um, made it so much easier for people to access the court. When you have an e-filing case now, you don't have to all the costs of printing copies of each document and having to have somebody carry it to the registry and stamp it in. That's done automatically from your, your computer and it's filed in the court within two minutes of your sending it off. Um, um, so a lot of expenses are saved doing that. And then more importantly, we have now developed the strategy of using what I call the virtual courtroom. I hear all your high tech students would like that. That we can be in Trinidad and the lawyers and the litigants can be somewhere else and the case can be heard. Robert Pass, come here for me. I brought a, a, one of the things I had wanted to do was to play, play you an audio clip of a lawyer in Guyana where he had a case before the CCJ. And for one reason or another, he was unable, he and his client were unable to travel to Trinidad. And we put arrangements in place and listened to what he had to say.
dealing with cases, media, and in fact less expensive to members of the public. But in my case, I didn't have to leave and some of the, you know, for, for a long time there, there's been talk about uh, okay, I think that 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 uh, advances to be made, proposals for the facilitate enhancement of. Yeah. You see, I don't know if that answers your question. I don't know if that answers your question. Miss? Have I answered your? OK. Yeah. OK. Um, I've basically um, um, some opinions. I think what happened to us in the Caribbean is that we don't market things. Uh -huh. I know there is a concern um, with the CCJ of people um, thinking about the quality of the judges that we have in the Caribbean. I mean, I'm aware, I read the research, and I'm aware that we have quality judges, we have a lot of bright people um, who is all over the world taking part in those things. One of the biggest problems with us in the Caribbean, even in Grenada here, we don't market or we don't let people know you know, the, the people that we have, what they do, we don't let, even children, this helps to motivate people too. If I know that a Grenadian is a scientist as a youth, it helps me motivate myself to try to become a scientist. And somehow we secretly hold all the people that are, you know, capable of doing things, we keep them somehow like, a, like the, the best secret. So people have those concerns because we do not let people know who we have. So people are concerned about the type of judges we have, if they qualify enough, and stuff like that. You know, added to that, the gentleman asked about earlier on. About? The, the, Mr. Williams, when he asked about the Constitution. Yeah. No, this ah, is a... I had a question. I had a question. Yeah. I mean, my concern is, why is the Constitution is not made available in schools? Excuse me. I have a, I had a, you see, I, I, I'd wanted to harass the school children about that. Because, yeah. <laughs> let me tell you why. Um... In the early days, Mr. Branch was making a joke about my age and about how high-tech the school children are. Do you know that I downloaded the Grenada Constitution from the internet and I have it on my computer? Every child here in this college could go and Google Grenada Constitution right now and download it free of cost on their laptop. It's available to every single person. Yes, I accept that. I know that. Uh, but then why make the comment? No, no. And no. why not encourage them to do that? No, well, this is what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that they're not, they do not create, we do not create as a people, we do not create a culture so that from, from young growing up, that people know that we need to know the Constitution. Ah. So that's what it is. They know where it is. When you have to do an exam, they go get it and they go pass it. Good. But it is not make available and what the things are in the Constitution. So what I'm saying is that, it's just as the, as the, as, as, as the CCJ, I, I personally believe in the CCJ. I'm, I'm happy it's coming. But why is it that we are concerned today to making this announcement about the CCJ when it should have been happening long before? Yeah. Okay. We are not doing enough. And we have to blame ourselves by what we do. I do that. I ask my students to come here and I tell them about the importance of the CCJ. I give them some, you know, some of the ideas where it is important. What I'm saying as a people, I do think that we need to push a little bit more when it comes to the rights of people, even in health and safety. Thank you. You know, one of the, one of the things I've been, see, I've been saying when I've been making speeches like this is that I felt that I'm... Um, leaving it to people like me to speak about the CCJ is not good enough. So I did a level which I agree with what the last speaker said. Okay. Because well, I think it's time that civil society, ordinary folk in this, in this society, you need to have different voices. And I was hoping that we'll have had some voices from Sixth Form. Who is your debating champion here in Sixth Form? You all have a debating society? Yeah. You have a, somebody whisper yes. Yeah. Right, so where, where, are they, where are they talkers from the school? Because people like that, you need new voices. And I endorse what the last speaker said. Uh, and thank you, Justice Byron. Just a quick comment um, on the fears um, that I've picked up in terms of CCJ. Um, 
yes, the Caribbean Court of Justice, yes, Caribbean people becoming their own authority, but at the moment, what we have is the authority of our slave masters. Their money is in our pocket, their language is in our mouth, the, process, the structure of the political and legal system is illegal, the stamping of a flag, the killing of Caribbean Arawaks, the importing of slaves, and today, are we talking about breaking away from their system to practice their system against us? Or are we going to find the Caribbean true justice system, which is unfettered by money or consideration of status and class? Are we going to find the true system that not only is right for Grenada, but for the whole of humanity? Would the CCJ be going in that direction of redefining our lives outside the context of our slave Man, master? I'm so happy for that question. No, no, I mentioned before, just a little while ago, about going online to get the greater constitution. How many of you all here have gone online and looked at the CCJ website? I want to see hands. You understand? Not enough. Now, you all, that is something that you should just do. You see, C CCJ on social media. We have a Facebook account. We have a Twitter account. Uh, we, you're laughing. You don't believe me, eh? I'm um, serious. You go on the website and you get linked to all this type of information. What's relevant about your point is this. One of the commitments of the CCJ is to develop what we call Caribbean jurisprudence. So we are committed to transformation and we are committed to bringing justice back to our community. I, I, I don't know if you, these young people are interested in a story from my youth. When I, I was born in 1943, during the Second World War, and in my home, my father was a very interested in things like that, and so I grew up in an environment where I knew, for example, that Caribbean men and women, not yet free, still subservient, went and stood shoulder to shoulder with their English masters to fight against the myth of racism, uh, which represented what the Nazis were fighting for. So at the end of the Second World War, when you had the declaration of the Human Rights Declaration, declaring all persons equal, I was convinced that the Caribbean contributed to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So I grew up with a feeling that I was equal to anybody in the world. Now, when I went to England to study law, I was in class with English people. And I had this feeling of I being having exactly the same rights as a human being as them. And so it was a great irritation to me that cases from my country had to go up there for them to judge. When I had been reading about great Caribbean lawyers, great Caribbean jurists who have made their name on the international scene, and I had the good fortune to contribute to that legacy of the Caribbean. So why is it that our people feel that they'll get better justice in England? I, 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 I myself don't quite understand that. I, I know people feel that way, but I'm hoping that by exposure and by discussion that they'll overcome that and realize, realize that... Um, um, yeah, not better justice. There is no justice under the English legal system. Yeah. Sorry. There is no justice. You have to buy and sell food. We're the only species on the planet that buys and sells food. Every other creature feeds freely. And the creation of criminality begins when that mother is forced to ask the child to pay for milk. The creation of criminality is when the necessities are denied our people as it was come through slavery. And up to today, 2018, we're still honoring their illegal legal system. So the Caribbean Court of Justice, yes, let's go that way, but let's not imitate them. Let us find the truth, find the constitution of our nations, and bring it to our people. That's, that's what I'm suggesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> but I want to hear from somebody from Sixth Form. Ah.
<laughs> come back, come, come, come. All right. Um, when it comes to Jersey Shore business, I have big concern because, and my own opinions because of what I see happen in local courts. Right. And that brings me back to what I would have heard Mr. Williams said. I'm of the opinion, sometimes I wonder if judges and lawyers work together in what is called justice. In that, I see cases, or I have cases whereby, based on how much money I have, you can buy a justice. So, um, so when the CCG came about and everything, I'm hearing about it, but I haven't taken any personal interest in it because of how justice appeared to be justice, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, two persons can commit the same crime. And one, and based on what the law is saying, based on the sentencing can be completely different because of the financial position of one person that do the crime. I can't understand that. I see, and that is my problem with what we call justice. Now you see, I don't know how to answer the question. No, I'm serious. Because I'm a judge. And if I thought that one person got better justice because they had more money than the other person, I would be horrified and angry myself. Well, that is why you need a court like us. Because basically what a final court of appeal does if they have, look, look, when you look at, at how societies are structured um, and the judicial systems are structured, it has been accepted that you're going to have um, um, dissatisfaction at the first trial. So you create a, a level of appeal to the Court of Appeal. But it's also known that there are also problems at that level. So you have a third appeal. So all societies in the world have a trial court, a court of appeal, and a final court. And that is created because it is known that you're going to have problems in the justice sector. And society has then created a system to correct those injustices. So now if, for example, you have a situation like that in, um, where somebody... Look, look, okay, let me give you a, a situation that we have done at the CCJ. One of the problems that must affect people who are concerned about human rights is the number of young people in our society who stay in remand for a long time without trial. It must hurt anybody's feelings. Now, at the CCJ, we had a chance to do something about it. Because in Barbados, um, they had appeals to us. And we were able to make a decision which stated that anybody who was convicted and sentenced, the time they spent in remand had to be taken into account in their sentencing period. And that has made a transformation in the lives of many young people in our society. So the having a court like us um, sometimes addresses problems like that when they are brought to our attention. I can give you many other examples. For example, we had a case, another case from Barbados where a man was, was charged with, with murder. And the evidence against him was purely circumstantial. In fact, the main evidence against him was a dentist had said that a bite mark on the victim matched his teeth formation. And the guy was saying, I'm innocent. I didn't do the crime. 
and he wanted to hire uh, a forensic expert to examine his teeth and examine the bite mark and give evidence about it. And um, he didn't have the money. He didn't have the money to hire the expert. And this matter came before our court and we ordered the government to pay for him to hire the expert so he could get justice. So, so and I can give you many examples that, that, that the rule of a court like ours will help to address the concern that you mentioned, which we all know is a real concern. But the structure of a society requires different levels of courts to correct problems of this nature. And that's one of the things that we think the CJ has been trying to do. All right, so let's use the same um, scenario that they just would have used, but on the victim side of it. So someone would have killed a family member of mine, and all the evidence is there, and the person, after the judicial process would have taken place, would have been sentenced to 25 years. And some years down the line, you in, in the media, you hear that the person, uh, based on new evidence or whatever, is no longer in prison. What, what do you mean, how do you mean not, not in prison? Escape? Because they would, have, they would have appealed the decision and whatever. You mean that the court had a second hearing? Yeah. I made a different decision. So, yeah. So, the okay. first court, right. 25 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in about five years' time, you, the person is back in the public. And there is a lot of that in Grenada. In that, a no, no, man... No, 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 no. Wait, hold on. Let me... Let me I, I so, not, no, no, I'm not criticizing you. Yeah. I'm just trying to understand what the point you're making. Okay, so... I, I did not... No, no, no. There's a, oh, that's a very small question that is in my mind. They are back in the public because of a second court hearing or for other reasons? Well, it had to be a court hearing because that's, that's, they that's, were... That's what my question was. So, mm -hmm. all right, so in a, in, a, in a party, a young man walk up to a next man, use a weapon, he inflict a wound, that wound, result to the death. The person get 25 years. But the family or whoever of that person that is now in jail, they go back to the court and they do whatever the process is. I don't know the correct term to use. And in a short space of time, that person get that sentence of 25 years to be reduced to five years, four years. There are people who commit murder and only spent a couple of months in jail and, the end, and there was more than 10, 15, 20 witnesses seeing that person doing the incident. So that's say I have serious problem with what no, we call wait justice. Wait, wait a minute. No, 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 no. That is why you have appeal courts. You see, if somebody goes before a court and the court gives a, a judgment which you think is not fair, then you appeal to the Court of Appeal. If the Court of Appeal gives a judgment which you think is not fair, then you appeal. Now, right now, you have to appeal to the Privy Council. And that's a problem in Grenada because appealing to the Privy Council is very expensive and very complicated. So, well, nobody appeals to the Privy Council in Grenada. Do you know anybody appeals to the Privy Council in Grenada? What I'm saying, you hardly have any cases going to the Privy Council. So people who have these complaints don't have a chance to get a final court to judge what happened. So I'm now I'm thinking, that the one CCJ, is on, the on CCJ, the other side. The what? CCJ is more accessible, and people who have those complaints will now have a court to go to that will make an assessment of whether what happened in the courts below was right or wrong. Okay, so you as a family member, you lost, you lost somebody through like a murder committed. And the, the murderer go through the court system and he get his sentence reduced by less than half. What do, what do we as, how the CCG know? What does the CCG have in place of people like who are the victim of the situation to say, look, listen, 
This man was sentenced to 25 years. Are you one of And it was reduced to are, five are, years. Are you, are you one of I, I hear your question very well. Right. How do you, as the, in, as, the, as the person, as a family member of the victim, deal with that through the CCG? No, I hear your question very well. Um, but my question to you is, are you one of the lost students? Sorry? Are, are you one of the prospective lost students? No, I'm not a teacher. You're, you're a teacher? Yes, sir. Now, part of the... Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason why I cannot answer his question directly is because the legal principles that are applicable to every case depend on detailed knowledge of the factual situation. So in order to make an assessment of right and wrong, one would have to know the details of the factual circumstance. I'm suggesting to you that that's the reason why you have appeal courts like the CCJ, because if matters have reached the court of appeal, there is a right of appeal from the Court of Appeal to the CCJ, and those questions will be examined, and efforts will be made to find a just result to those situations. You can't appeal if you don't have a court to appeal to. And, and we are saying that the CCJ will fulfill a need which is not being filled in the society at the moment. Yes. Good morning. Um, or afternoon. Sorry, we've been here a while. Normally, when you come to a, um, normally when you come to a forum, you come expecting something. So um, yesterday, when they told us we're coming to hear a presentation or to just hear about the CCJ because of the referendum, I came expecting to hear why the CCJ. Now, from what we've heard, I understand that it's much cheaper um, to have the CCJ. I also understand that it's, it's, it's better, for lack of a better word, sorry, to have your final court of appeal or to have your, your um, to just have everything in the Caribbean instead mm -hmm. of going to England. What I want from you as former president of the CCG is what else, what, 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 is it, what is it in there for me, other than what I just said, that will make me go and say yes on November 6th. I am saying yes to the CCG. What? Why? Why the CCG? I, I can read. I have done my research. Um, I have heard from various persons why they think the CCG is a good thing for Grenada and why they think it's not. But I'm asking you, as former president, in your opinion, why the CCG for Grenada? Don't go, don't go yet. Let me explain to you. When I was making inquest, in, inquiries as to what type of information this audience would require, mm -hmm. I was told that many people had been complaining that the presenters who had been addressing the CCJ interest were speaking down to the audiences that they were speaking about matters which were of interest to them and not paying attention to what was of interest to the persons to whom they were speaking. So I decided that instead of just giving you a lecture, because I do have a lecture prepared, and if you want, I can circulate it so you can read it at your leisure. But I thought it would have been more useful for me to actually hear you and respond to the matters which were of concern to you. So, so the questions that I have answered reflected questions and concerns that people had. Now, I'm not, I don't quite understand you. What your concern seems to be is that you want me to be more... Um, um, so, um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer. <laughs> Yeah, right. so, you just, you, so you want me to do exactly what I didn't want so to do you and give my every, lecture. You answered everybody's questions, and yeah. I got a lot from it. But, but so, is there so something, is there something is, that, I just want that, some more, some more specifics. I understand that. But was there a concern that you had that I could address? No specific concern. I just want to make sure that on November 6th, when I go to make a decision, I am making the best decision for my country. 
For, I want to. Okay. Okay, I understand you now. Okay. So you, you just want me to give you a few more reasons Thank why you. you should support the yes, CCJ. Yes. Okay. Now, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes, you wanted to contribute to that. concern is I want to know why not why do we have to stray away from the Privy Council tell me about what are the issues with the Privy Council besides finance and in terms of getting reach to them and stuff like that tell me what is the Privy Council not doing persuade me towards the, ch the CCJ side if you understand what I'm saying tell me something okay the Privy well, Council, excuse me yes. my, my answer to you really is mm -hmm. first of all simple statistics. Um, do you know how many cases have gone to the Privy Council from Grenada in the last 10 years? I am not aware. Stop. Mr. Branch, do you know? Is it more than five? Um, in the last 10 years, um, I don't have the exact number, but I've conferred with Mr. Branch and his memory is similar to mine. In the last 10 years, you have had less than five cases from Grenada to the Privy Council. Now, this could mean two things. It could mean that people who go before the court here are so satisfied with the outcome of their court cases that they don't want to appeal. No, it could, it could mean that. It could mean that. It could also mean that the people who want to appeal cannot appeal because it is too expensive and it's too complicated. And I'm suggesting that that is a problem here in Grenada, right. that the people do not have access to uh, appeal to address issues that concern them. Uh, what I'm saying, what I've been trying to point, one of the points I've been trying to make is that the access to the Caribbean Court of Justice is easier, it's cheaper, and it's open to everybody. In the countries where we are the final court of appeal, Belize, Barbados, and Guyana, the numbers of appeals are growing every year. So ordinary folk are now having an opportunity to get final justice that they did not have under the Privy Council. And to my way of thinking, the question of just access to justice is one of the most important reasons for signing on to the Caribbean Court of Justice. All right, I understand that, but in other countries where access to the Privy Council is on a high level, the percentage is high. Were there any issues of those who appealed from the Privy Council? Anybody? I, I don't, any I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand the problem. From the decision made from the Privy Council, from an appeal from somebody from a more fortunate country who could appeal to them, have there been any issues about the decision made, the final decision? About the quality made? of the decision making yes. Privy Council? Yes. <laughs> well, you, you see, I don't really want to to go down that road. Right. Uh, no, I'll tell you why. It, it's not that I can't. Um, and you all are intelligent people. Um, nobody who sits in a final court of justice is always right. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we are not God. And people have to understand that what a, a judge does is his best. Now, even if you do your best, somebody else may find a ground to criticize you. Um, so I can criticize judgments of the Privy Council, but I don't think it is useful to do that in this kind of environment, because it is a normal element of being human 
that there will be differences of opinion. But what you do know, I don't know, are you one of the law students? Yes. You're one of the law students. Now, you have read many judgments from the English House of Lords and the Privy Council. And you would have observed that when they're given a judgment, all of those judges don't agree. In almost every case you have, you have one judge saying something, and another judge saying what that judge said was nonsense, you should do it this way. So you find even among the judges in the Privy Council themselves, they don't always agree on what is the right outcome. And that's a normal part of the judicial exercise. So that, to me, is not a basis for judgment. Because I and anybody can find things cr to criticize about the Privy Council or about any court. Um, what I think is more important is, are you satisfied that you have access to justice, that the court hears both parties, that the court gives an honest um, um, a, 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 a appraisal of the facts that are presented to it and applies the law to it. If the court does that and gives you an opportunity to have your point adjudicated, then I think you have a court that's worthy of support. And that is what we have been offering to the persons who have come before our court. And I think that in Grenada, you will find that once you have the Privy Council, once you have the Caribbean Court of Justice as a final court of appeal, you'll have many more cases that will come before the court. And a lot of the complaints that people have been making on the road, you'll have a chance to have them assessed and analyzed uh, at a different level. So that is one of the major issues that we have to offer. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Hello. Yes, I just think that some of the students are not understanding fully the role of the Privy Council. From based on what they're asking, I'll tell you this. The Privy Council for the students, I'm thinking, is not in our active vocabulary. So it's not something that you know exists. I mean, based on, and I'm not saying that they're not smart. I'm just saying that I believe that in Grenada, the average Grenadian, if you meet them on the street and say, and you see these shows where somebody put a mic in front of you and they ask you a question and the person who is the prime minister and they, it's a kind of moment like that where it has been in the newspaper, but if you meet the average person on the street that you want to vote, you're not going to say, could you tell me what is the Privy Council? They might, well, I think it's the final court of appeal, but they're not able to clearly state the role and function of the Privy Council. And when you line that up with the CCJ, it's the same thing. You might say here, well, it's too expensive, and she asked a very important question. If you are going to, and the young student there, and we not go, don't lose the, the, um, these questions, you want to tell me, I thought also it was for you to persuade me why go CCJ. But you have to tell me it's, it is too expensive. It's probably cost about 100,000 um, pounds to bring a, course, co a case before the CCJ. Um, it, you, the decisions, it takes a, a long period of time to get justice. And you want, just like independence, the fight for independence in Grenada, in, for, in Grenada was not readily accepted by everybody, all right? So you had Gary and, and his men who were fighting independence, took a while before they get it. In fact, Grenadians did not come on board with him fully. It's not something everybody was saying, we want independence, yeah, that's the way to go. But you had to make a strong case for it. And in terms of the CCJ, I, I probably want to hear a stronger case for it. The discussion is fine, and people are getting little bits of information, yeah, I think. But in terms of if I meet the student outside and I say, tell me what is the CCJ? Why do you want us to, maybe you can say, to vote for the CCJ? 
Why should you vote for this issue? I don't know if they're able to give me a, a clear enough answer. And for this reason, some people don't bother vote. I don't understand this thing. I'm, I'm not voting. So I, I, I'm just, I just probably wish that we can probably take a few minutes to persuade, as both young people are saying, persuade and say, this is what we want. This is the, uh, an opportunity for self-reliance, for self-determination, to make, be our own boss, to make our own decision, to be um, our own Caribbean people. Or when you look at the Caribbean person, this is a Caribbean person. When the world look at the Caribbean, they can say, we have independence. We have our final court of appeal. We know what we are doing. This is the ideal Grenadian, the ideal Caribbean person. But I don't know if I'm hearing it. And um, Excuse I, I me, wish. excuse me. Clearly. Excuse me. Sure. You know what I thought as I was listening to you? Excuse me? You know what I thought as I listened to you? No. You gave six reasons why you should vote for the CCJ. Uh -huh. Okay. And you said you don't know what reasons to give. Well, I didn't hear but, it from you, so no, I thought no, you had something but, but different. I I this is it. just from my knowledge <laughs> yeah, but, but, as a student, but, 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 but why fight for something? I mean, when you tell students, well, why did Grenada get independence? To make our own decision. We want to be self-reliant. We want to be able to, we yeah, don't those, always those, want those, England those to make a decision same, for us. Those are the same reasons. And I've explained that it's an element of completing the circle of independence. That is uh, an issue for uh, human equality to have the final adjudication of our legal affairs. Mm -hmm. I've indicated that a wider range of, of disputes will be adjudicated at the final level, giving the court an opportunity to hand down rulings which will affect the way how people live on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. and improve the way in which they interact with the judicial system. Okay. I've explained that the access to the court is easier and it's cheaper and that people have the opportunity to access the court using technology so that they don't even have to travel to train and to come before the court. I've explained that the Apex Court is involved in judicial reform okay. and in, involved in judicial education okay. uh, in a way the Privy Council does not. And when you have a court like ours, it gets directly involved in judicial reform programs mm -hmm. within Grenada. Mm -hmm. And I gave an example of one program that we have already okay. done. Okay. And that there are many other programs which we are engaged in mm -hmm. uh, and which we are capable and interested in doing. Okay. One of the reasons why I had mentioned the website issue is that on the website, the court's strategic plan exists. Okay. And it would be in of interest if your students looked at our strategic plan, mm -hmm. because that lays out in detail um, what the court plans to do mm -hmm. to improve the quality of justice delivery in the region. So, so one of the issues of interest to me was to have got the student body to access the CCJ website. Okay. Um, if they did that, they would see a lot of the fundamental documents of the court. But one of the other important things which they would see, which I'd like them to see, and particularly the gentleman who raised the question of, of um, the quality of justice. Mm -hmm. What he's basically saying is that is justice quality good enough? Okay. Um, if you go on the CCJ website, um, every single case that the CCJ has dealt with mm -hmm. has been videotaped, and the video is on the website. Okay. So each of you can go on the website and actually see how the court operates. Let me and ask you a question, yes. though. Um, the CCJ is currently functioning. It, yes. It's currently functioning. Who are the current members of the, that sign on to this court? Because I think we need just to, all just, right, all right. I mean, um, you don't need to give me all. No, I can. But it, no, no, is no, this, no, I, I can do it. And easily. is it at CARICOM level? No, no. I, I must say, I, I apologize. I thought that at the sixth form, no. that would be basic knowledge which everybody would have. No. Um, the CCJ court, the CCJ 
was formed by CARICOM governments. Right. Good. Students, you knew this? Yeah. Right. Good. And the, all of the CARICOM governments have signed on to the court mm -hmm. and made a financial contribution to the operation of the court. Okay. Uh, that was very important because the court was started with a trust fund of 100 million US dollars. Mm -hmm. And each country paid up their share, including Grenada. Okay. So Grenada is a fully financial member of the Caribbean Court of Justice. Okay. Um, the, and all of the countries participate in what we call the original jurisdiction of the court. The court operates at two levels, and it's a very unique court in this unique court around the world. Because not only is it set up as a final appellate court, but it also set up to enforce the obligations of the single market and economy. And Grenada is a part of that court. And I understand, for example, that people in Grenada have actually brought a case before the Criminal Court of Justice for the protection of their rights in the honey industry, where they've been experiencing discrimination when they export honey to Trinidad. And the CCJ deals with cases like that. And Grenada is already a part of that jurisdiction of the court. Now, the countries who have got the final appellate jurisdiction are Guyana, Barbados, Belize, and Dominica. Okay. And those are the ones from whom we hear appeals. And from those four countries, we have already had about 150 appeals. Okay. And so lots of people have been coming before the court and getting the appeals heard. Right. In the U.S., there are... Yeah. for having to cut Justice Byron, but what we'll do is that we'll end the stations have to return to normal broadcast, so we'll have to have the official vote of thanks now. Justice Byron would remain to answer any additional questions that you may have. Okay. So I invite now Joshua Francis on behalf of CAMCC to move a vote of thanks. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'd like to first start off by thanking the doctor, the Right Honorable Keith Mitchell, for being in attendance. I would also like to thank Sir Dennis Bryan for coming and informing us about the CCJ and how it can impact us in the Caribbean region, taking independence into our own hands in a new way, and looking at law and the treatment of law in our region in a more critical way where we can get what we want or try to seek justice as best as possible. I'd also like to thank um, Mr. Robert Branch. Um, he's been here and he's been excellent. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the lecturers, the students, the, the media that have been present, listening and broadcasting and taking an active part and active role in engaging in this forum. And we'd like to thank you for being in attendance. I'd like to thank you all for being in attendance, and I'd like to thank you all for contributing and learning and desiring to learn more about what is a very critical decision in our future. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Joshua. And I just want to say that this has been an excellent program. We were given one hour to do this uh, um, presentation but we're now approaching two hours, so it really shows the interest that you have in the CCJ and wanting to get more information. But you can remain to ask questions of Justice Byron, if you wish. So thank you, and thank you to all the stations who have brought this live broadcast. Oh, I just want to ask this um, quickly. Um, in the United States,
Government moves to improve the practice of conveyancing. Details to this story and more in the National Report. With the details to the news for Monday, September 17th, 2018, I am Rakesha St. Louis. Government moves to reduce the search period for land deeds and titles under the Conveyancing and Law of Property Amendment Act 2018. Amendment to the Principal Act means that the period of search needed in order to determine good routes of title to land will be 30 years instead of the common law period of 60 years. Minister for Youth Development, Sports, Culture and the Arts, Senator the Honorable Norland Cox, says as it stands now, the deeds and law registry is chaotic. During a meeting of the Upper House on Friday, he said with the amendment, government will be rectifying the issues of lengthy and inconclusive searches for title deeds and several complaints from landowners. Grenada will join several Caribbean islands who have similar experiences and who have reduced the search period. We are seeking to make this amendment to go back to 30 years. The reason for that, Mr. President, why are we seeking this amendment? Due to a number of unfortunate incidents, uh, like for example, during Hurricane Ivan, some of the records have gotten damage from water damage at the registry. And as such, that render some gaps within the, the period in which you have to search. So in some cases, when you go back 40 years, there is nothing there, there is a gap. So you might get something 50 years, you might get something 30, some you might get 40, some you might get, so there are gaps in between. So you cannot really complete your search properly. Senator Cox recommended the adoption of technology at the registry, adding that a computerized system will provide further checks and balances for the process. We recognize the most ideal thing for us is to have a computerized system. Uh, this would require significant investment on our part. This will require extensive work in terms of doing topographic maps and, and having all this registry built. But we believe that what we're seeking to do today, this amendment, is a, a step in the right direction to remedy the situation currently. But definitely, we will we definitely have to move towards what you call a registered system where no searches would not have to be done. It would be much more easier because everything is up to date. The amendment was supported by Senator the Honorable Winston Galloway. 30 years is pretty safe. We have information that will guarantee in, in quote-unquote terms that you can establish title. But I look forward to us moving the bar and very shortly. There are other means around that you can establish title without using this 30 years. We talk about a registration system, but we need to get there. Senator Cox highlighted that persons who acquired lands and titles under the Possessory Title Act of 2015 will not be affected by the amendment made under the Conveyancing and Law of Property Amendment Act 2018. Officials from the Caribbean Court of Justice, including former President Sir Dennis Byron, will address the first public meeting of the CCJ Advisory Committee at the Deluxe Cinema in Grenville on Tuesday. The meeting will be held to create greater awareness on plans by Grenada to accede to the CCJ as this country's final appellate court. Prior to the meeting at the Deluxe Cinema, which starts at 6 p.m., Sir Dennis will meet with students of the T.A. Marisha Community College at 10.30 to discuss the benefits of being a member of the regional court. In preparation of the referendum, persons throughout Grenada believes that this is the opportune time for Grenada to transition from the Privy Council. Yeah, I mean, it's about time. It's long overdue. We should um, be there because, you know, get get out of the British thing. And so we are all one Caribbean. And I think that will be binding us more together because we have CARICOM. So we should have all of that in one, you know, with it thing. Because they are good lawyers, too, you know, and good judges. West Indian people, they are, we are capable of handling our own. I go say do it. Vote for CCJ. I don't know for someone because everybody has for them one opinion. My opinion, I say, go to. For me, I say, go to. I think it's a very good thing. 
you know, because we could be home here, right in Grenada yourself, and we could see everything what going on. We could know everything what going on. We could just use the phone, and then we could tell when the case go appeal. Instead, we, you know, we day in jail, suffering. I never been in jail. I don't want to be in jail, but I find now this is a very good thing. If we could get it like that, we could really appreciate that. This is the National Report. More news after the break. The house was shaking, shaking. Then said the story here, babe. Crack, 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 crack. And the roof had gone. Man, I was so scared, I nearly wet myself. Only those who have lived it can truly understand the devastating fury of a hurricane's wind. The house across the road just get up and roll over. Hurricane force wind. It's a hazard. Hazards. Take control. Reduce your loss. You can hurricane proof your home. For example, Make your roof more wind resistant by using screws instead of nails in its construction. Find out more about hurricane force winds and other hazards at your local disaster office. A message from the National Disaster Management Agency and Sidera. Welcome back. The government of Grenada has recognized the exploits of CAC World Heavy and Super Heavyweight Champion Damian Daniel, who has been flying the Grenada flag in the field of bodybuilding. An award ceremony was held on Friday at the Ministerial Complex, organized by the Ministry of Youth Development, Sports, Culture and the Arts, partnering with the Ministry of National Security and Prime Minister Dr. The Right Honorable Keith Mitchell. Damian started out as an amateur and is now a qualified professional bodybuilder, capturing more than 10 gold medals from various competitions. The bodybuilding champion, who is originally from the parish of St. David, has contributed to the exposure of Grenada in the diaspora as he excels in the sport internationally. He says his achievement is a testimony of hard work, discipline and dedication, not just in the sports, but in life generally. Being here it's really started from something which was a tragic, which was really like a negative way into a positive. Me losing my mom, this was a way for me to, to just really come out of the out negative into the positive, where I just started to like lift stones and batteries as a way to just stay on the positive really side. You know, and I just want to say to young persons out there, at times you really feel like giving up. There are a lot of avenues where bodybuilding definitely could just shape you and take you from the negative way, bring you into the positive. It is not an easy journey to just like go out to represent Grenada, but when you really have the backing of the people, your family, your friends, it definitely is always a pleasure just going out there and represent Grenada. So I just want to say to all my friends, family, thank you for all the support from all over the years for being on board, when I really fell down, you never really gave up on me. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Mitchell praised the bodybuilder for his humility and commitment to the sport. You will see this young man around and you will not know who he is. He never shows himself. He accepts victory and you would not know that it's somebody that's performed that well. It's very simple and humble. He had a lot of trials and tribulations in going, meeting his goals. And he never complains. It's, sometimes I have to ask him, how are you making it? And then he would tell me, well, the problems he's having. You know, knowing the successes that he's had, I genuinely believe we did not treat him the way we should. Minister of Sports, Senator Norland Cox, promised that government is doing its best to secure the necessary support for sportsmen here in Grenada. We are going to do everything that we can. We are going to do our best to see how we can support the athletes. We, we have some unique situations uh, that is just coming to us. And we don't know how we're going to address it as yet. But the most important thing, we are committed to see how we can solve it. So we want to, to say that. I want to wish Damien and the uh, Federation all the best going forward. I know that you have a tournament coming up soon in November in Spain. Um, we wish you all the best. On that, and we are going to do everything we can to, to support you in that regard. That story just brought the curtains down on the National Report for today. Let's recap the top story. Government moves to improve the practice of conveyancing. On behalf of everyone who made this newscast possible, I am Rakesha St. Louis saying thank you for joining us. Until next time.
30 minutes. You could be on one of our 45 black and white sand beaches, or perched atop a lush mountainside admiring our stunning coastline, or slicing the Caribbean Sea on a traditionally built sloop, or adventuring off the beaten path, or hanging out with our underwater sculptures, or do nothing at all. Whatever you choose, an amazing vacation is only 30 minutes away in Grenada. Visit www.puregrenada.com.